Good afternoon, everyone. I was just waiting for a few people to get seated and then we can get started. Thank you so much for being here on a Sunday afternoon, especially during game seven of the Warriors playoff games. So we appreciate your support. Um, welcome on behalf of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive to the 2023 Legion Lecture. I'm Rosalind Kyo, the guest curator of the exhibition Endless Knot, Struggle and Healing in the Buddhist World, uh, which is currently on view in the galleries downstairs until May 7th. Uh, just a plug, I will be giving my last curator's talk on May 7th, Sunday at 4 p.m. if you would like to join us. Um, I completed my PhD at Berkeley, uh, at UC Berkeley in the History of Art Department and um, was fortunate enough to be the Mellon Curatorial Postdoctoral Fellow at Banff from 2017 to 2018, during which I curated Master Traces, Transcultural Visions, and Boundless Contemporary Tibetan Art, um, Artists at Home and Abroad. I was delighted to have the opportunity to consult on the exhibition of Wesley Tongson's uh, works in Spiritual Mountains in 2022. Um, and it was a great pleasure to be the guest curator of Endless Knot, which features works from the museum's outstanding and rare Asian art collection. So please do go downstairs and have a look. Today, I'm pleased and honored to welcome internationally renowned contemporary artist Tseren Sherpa to give the annual Legion le uh, Collection Lecture. This endowed lecture series is supported by the Legion Guohua Foundation, which serves to promote our understanding of Asian art by bringing lectures by leading scholars and artists to major US universities and museums, including UC Berkeley. Our special thanks goes out to Banfa trustee, Vinnie Miller, who is here with us today for her incredibly generous support of this program. Thank you so much, Vinnie. The list of accomplishments of today's special guest speaker grows daily. Tara Sherpa is a contemporary artist born in Nepal and currently based in Kathmandu. He learned traditional Tonka painting techniques from his father, the master Tonka painter Ugen Dorje. During his years in the San Francisco Bay Area, Saren developed a singular style that brings traditional techniques and iconography into his contemporary paintings and installations. Most recently, Saren's work was featured at Nepal's debut pavilion at the 2022 Venice Biennale, as well as in exhibitions at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, the Rubin Museum, the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, and the Peabody Essex Museum just to name a few. <laughs> Today, he'll be sharing with us his most recent works since returning to Nepal in 2018 to begin the Himalayan Art Initiative in Kathmandu, which he will also um, talk to us about today. As an extra dimension of this program, immediately following the lecture, we'll be presenting a documentary film about Saren titled Above and Below, The Life of Artist Saren Sherpa. We're delighted that the director of Above and Below, Sherry Brenner, is also here with us today. Brenner, who, was, who has created several documentaries on the spiritual practices and, and Tibetan art, is currently adjunct professor and media lab director in media studies at the University of San Francisco. Her credits include the national PBS broadcast of Sand Painting, Sacred Art of Tibet, and In Beauty I Walk, the Navajo Way to Harmony. After the lecture and film, there will be a few minutes for a question and answer to both Saren Sherpa and the filmmaker Sherry Brenner. Now, please join me in welcoming Saren Sherpa. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Taylor. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I think we're good. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rosalind. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Berkeley Art Museum, uh, for this opportunity. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight, uh, today. <laughs> Sorry. I'm still, I'm still a little jet lagged, so please forgive me. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I will go through some slides here uh, first uh, to talk about my practice. I was uh, trained as a traditional Tanka artist uh, when I was pretty young, like by my father, uh, because uh, I think I'm kind of like the third generation within the family. So, this kind of traditional art was. Uh, so here's an example of one of the works. Uh, so uh, growing up in Nepal uh, within the artist, traditional artist family, it was uh, quite obvious that uh, my father seeing uh, some of my uh, drawing skills and also uh, my interest in art, uh, he wanted to hand, it, hand this down uh, uh, to one of his children and uh, being the oldest one he felt it was uh, important for him to pass it down to uh, me and uh, but uh, I also need to mention that uh, uh, in the 80s when I was growing up uh, in Nepal the traditional art had uh, become a little bit more uh, commodified uh, because these uh, practices were highly revered uh, when back in Tibet or even in Nepal. Uh, but uh, by the 80s, when I was growing up, uh, the traditional art was um, becoming more and more of a souvenir product uh, for people visiting Nepal and this kind of uh, sort of uh, degraded the quality of the works and also the practice and then the context for which these artworks were created uh, not just by uh, by the artists but also uh, within the community this work was being less and less appreciated so uh, here is an example of one of the works I created when I was here in California. It was commissioned to me by the Asian Art Museum for their permanent collection. And uh, so after that, like uh, after arriving in the Bay Area, I had the uh, opportunity to actually learn more about different uh, types of arts. Uh, let's say even art history, uh, Western art history. And... Uh, uh, because in Nepal, when I was growing up, there were very few galleries. Uh, there were almost no museums at all. Uh, There's one national museum which was there, and uh, we just had like a few, two or three examples of some of these uh, old uh, traditional artworks. Uh, so that... Uh, discouraged me to be an artist so I used to be really scared of my father so I ended up learning the techniques but I was never keen on becoming an artist and it was not until uh, I actually landed at the Asian Art Museum in Golden Gate Park in 1998 uh, that was the first time I ever walked into a proper uh, museum and uh, the first thing I remember, I remember like uh, paying $10 entry fee and walking in and seeing a very old tanka, probably from 17th century or so. And uh, I was a little bit like shocked because I expected something else to see. I had seen tankas like all of my life and uh, was uh, quite uh, surreal and unusual for me to see a traditional tanka being displayed in a museum. And then later, I also noticed like uh, the catalogs that they have published and uh, uh, many other things. And that sort of uh, regenerated my respect for the heritage, the culture, because I noticed like how this 
tradition was uh, appreciated in a different way. Uh, back home, uh, growing up in Nepal, the thangkas were either for religious purposes uh, or uh, commodified as a souvenir product and nothing in between. And uh, uh, it was appreciated as an art form here in a museum placed uh, with lots of respects, good lightings behind the glass case, uh, big, uh, thick uh, uh, catalogs being published, and then people studying about it. And that sort of like uh, regenerated my respect for this tradition. And uh, then like again, uh, the journey continued and uh, I also started working for a Buddhist foundation here in California and uh, started teaching some classes on Thangka painting also. But uh, uh, again, as a Thangka artist, uh, to uh, continue uh, your practice uh, was very limiting for me. And uh, after after getting influenced and uh, by many other artists here, I sort of like uh, uh, developed the courage to actually experiment something beyond the religious iconography. And I actually remember like seeing uh, one exhibition here uh, at the Berkeley Art Museum at the older location. Uh, uh, because at that time, I remember, like, uh, I used to see less of Asian artists' works. And the first exhibition that really sort of uh, uh, influenced me very strongly was uh, Mahjong, uh, which was of the contemporary Chinese art. And also later at the San Jose Museum, it was uh, contemporary Indian artists. So these two like uh, artist groups coming from the same geographical region sort of gave me the courage to experiment something new with my work also. And uh, so this is uh, one of my earlier experimentation. Uh, this is titled Modern Prayer Flag. I was actually exploring some of my experiences having been grown up in Nepal uh, seeing a lot of prayer flags around my parents' house. And here, like, uh, they were uh, sort of overtaken the same space by probably uh, lots of billboards. And uh, so I wanted to juxtapose that. And all of, the, all of the text in the back is actually in English. It's made to look like a uh, Tibetan script. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, all of the wordings are actually uh, taken from advertising slogans. So it's uh, <laughs> buy one, get one free, and <laughs> food for your busy lifestyle, etc. So uh, this was one of my earliest work. And uh, uh, later on, like I also wanted to experiment and see and uh, go deeper and find out like what I was doing as a Thangka painter here in the West. Uh, I was constantly thinking about my, because uh, we, traditionally we create these icons or iconographies uh, for our spiritual practice. But uh, in the US, uh, when I was uh, growing up, uh, living here, I was actually merely just trying to survive as an artist and constantly thinking about this, uh, whom to sell my next thangka to. And my students and friends were so supportive and they were just buying everything I was creating just to support me. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the work, uh, the, the icon was becoming more of a, you know, a product for me than a tool for meditation. And in 2010, I was fortunate to receive uh, a residency at the Vermont Studio Center in Vermont. And uh, there uh, was this program where I was supposed to create some, uh, a new work, basically, and exhibit it at the end of the residency. So, and I was thinking along like, uh, 
I was trying to search in myself to figure out like uh, who I am, what I'm doing, uh, what it means to be in this new environment, uh, new environment as in uh, the U.S. And uh, uh, so I think I was uh, nostalgic about my grandmother's like uh, uh, stories uh, when I was growing up, like she used to talk a lot about these uh, spirits because in the Himalayan region we have this culture of believing that uh, we have spirits of the mountain, spirits of the water, spirits of the valley and I was imagining whatever happens to these spirits if people from that region were uh, had moved on or gone to a new place uh, would the spirits follow them and if they did like how would they coexist in this new environment so um so that was like uh, an exploration of, uh, so uh, I have this series of uh, spirit uh, images, a uh, series of works, which is like uh, on the subject of spirits. And this is probably one of my first works. Uh, and then uh, this is another one, like, uh, uh, which is in 2012. <laughs> And apart from this, like, uh, there was another uh, series that I was also working on, which is, I call it fragment series. So basically, I would actually go into uh, the database of museums and uh, look through, like, uh, some of the old tankas uh, from, like, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, and then uh, repaint them in fragmented form. Uh, so uh, the idea actually occurred to me because uh, it was kind of interesting to see these nuclear families uh, in the diaspora from uh, the Himalayan region and uh, how they are trying to preserve like uh, a fragment of their culture, fragment of their uh, identity, fragment of their history. And uh, that was kind of uh, exciting for me to see that. and. So uh, this was actually in uh, Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh. And there's another like uh, series that I also started working on, uh, which was uh, basically uh, I had these archived uh, images of tankas when I was a tanka painter. Uh, so I would take these images, manipulate them, uh, partly on computer, partly by like, uh, uh, partly uh, uh, making, creating collage, and then uh, recreating something uh, a little abstract. Because uh, I was uh, also constantly thinking about like when you when you're painting some of these uh, traditional icons, then it 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 is very very. Uh, strict and you have to follow uh, like all the diagrams and measurement system that is uh, predefined for these images and uh, it was probably I was probably constantly thinking like what happens if I were to manipulate the form so would would the form still remain uh, 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 you mean like uh, I don't know conceptually is it still sacred or does it become like something else yeah. there's another one and uh, uh, so this like uh, was a commission from uh, Victoria and Albert Museum uh, this was in 2014 I think I uh, created uh, here like spirit and the and the abstract form comes together. And a uh, few more works. This was after the earthquake in Nepal in 2015. So uh, after that, I think uh, these are some of the examples of my works. And uh, uh, today I wanted to actually focus more on the uh, other subjects, which is like uh, my collaborations with uh, different uh, practices, different uh, things.
So this was my first <laughs> first uh, uh, work with the Jamba Juice. Uh, that was in 2003. So, uh, so I was commissioned by Jamba Juice to create like three marketing posters for their uh, uh, marketing campaign in 2003. And this was probably the first time I ever uh, did something which is non-sacred uh, artwork uh, beyond like uh, the traditional iconography. Uh, this sort of like helped me open up a little more, uh, uh, gave me the opportunity to see something beyond my practice as a traditional artist. And in 2015, actually, uh, right after the earthquake, I went back to Nepal. And in Nepal, I, I, I uh, was actually... Uh, I had a small studio uh, uh, temporarily because I was preparing for an exhibition in Hong Kong. And uh, then I learned like uh, the impact of earthquake like uh, on many different people. Uh, but uh, particularly like uh, there was, it was, I was also constantly thinking about the traditional artists because uh, my father and I had this conversation right after I w went back to Nepal uh, after the earthquake and we were talking about like uh, because the monuments, uh, the temples that are like 700, 800 or even 1000 year old were uh, damaged and destructed uh, to some extent and uh, we were concerned like if we had uh, fully trained uh, traditional artists who could actually uh, restore these monuments. And uh, uh, so uh, at one point I came across one a repose artist uh, who was actually telling me his story about like how difficult it is to be to practice as a traditional artist and he was on the verge uh, to give up everything and go to Malaysia as a uh, like manual labor or something uh, but when I saw his skill like I was just blown away so I thought like how do I change his mind from going away to Malaysia and give up his traditional practice like uh, so I just made up something and told him like, let's collaborate on something. I'm, I'm having an exhibition in Hong Kong. Maybe your skill set will be appreciated too. And so I came up with the design and I think you'll see that in the film, like uh, some of the process. Uh, and uh, he created this structure for me, uh, which actually got exhibited in Hong Kong at a gallery first. And then I was invited for Kathmandu, the, the inaugural Kathmandu Triennale in uh, Kathmandu in 2017. Right after that, I was invited to Inchuan Biennale uh, in China, and uh, we showed the same work. And then, like, after that, I was invited to New York to exhibit this at the Rubin Museum. So, uh, basically, uh, what it did was, uh, you have to understand this uh, situation in Nepal, like uh, traditional artists who are practicing in Kathmandu, they don't, uh, they're not like uh, uh, fully respected by the community itself. And uh, sometimes when you exhibit your work in like important institutions abroad, then suddenly you become uh, 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 an important entity. Because uh, so there's still that like, uh, how do you say, approval uh, needed somehow uh, from from outside. <laughs> so Rajan Shah, who I collaborated with, uh, actually gave up his idea on going to Malaysia after this. Uh, this work is acquired by the Rubin Museum for their permanent collection and uh, actually uh, like uh, on the database, you can see this work is also credited to him as in collaboration with Rajan Shah. Uh, so after that, he started getting lots of commissions for his uh, uh, work. 
And uh, here, uh, there's another bronze uh, that I collaborated with another like uh, bronze uh, traditional artist in in uh, Nepal. And the other one is a fiberglass uh, sculpture, also was in collaboration with another artist from Kathmandu. So uh, this, like the first uh, collaboration actually gave me uh, a lot of courage to come out and collaborate with these artists so that uh, their works are more visible uh, on international platform. Uh, this actually also gives them a lot of uh, like opportunity to uh, create more works and also appreciation within the community. Uh, apart from that, like I also wanted to, I also got the opportunity to work with other like uh, other uh, brands, maybe like uh, so. This was in collaboration with uh, Comme de Garçon uh, last year. Uh, I, I received an email from them saying like, uh, we would like to collaborate on some fabrics and on some uh, women's uh, clothing or men's clothing, etc. Uh, this was again, like, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm doing all of these like random things uh, uh, because uh, it gives our works a little more visibility because Nepal being a very small country uh, and the Himalayan region like uh, even smaller than that and uh, uh, the opportunity to exist and have that visibility is so important for us because we don't have like uh, important institutions, uh, uh, government support uh, so you have to try out everything to uh, be visible so that uh, somehow the international uh, art, uh, uh, how do you say, their focus is diverted towards Nepal too. This is another collaboration with uh, a rug maker uh, in Nepal. Uh, this was because uh, uh, rug making has been like uh, existing in Nepal for a long time, but uh, I found out like all of the designs actually come from the West, uh, from Germany, from the US, and then uh, Nepalese rug makers are becoming more and more of uh, like uh, manual labor, just uh, working on somebody else's design, even though in back in the 50s, 60s, uh, the rug, uh, traditional rugs were highly, highly appreciated and sought after. Uh, so in 2019, we decided uh, there's a rug maker in Nepal and him and I, like, uh, we decided maybe we should come up with some contemporary traditional designs. Uh, contemporary designs that are like influenced by contemporaries uh, works. So uh, we created some uh, we call it like art rugs. Basically, uh, they're they're manufactured in limited edition, and then we started exhibiting it like uh, in uh, different art fairs, uh, galleries, and uh, I think uh, for the first time this will be exhibited uh, at a museum too, uh, at the Asia Society in Houston uh, in in September. And just recently, I also collaborated with uh, Gucci. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, this was in St. Maurice in Switzerland, and they invited me to uh, do a project called uh, Artist in Flux. So it's actually because of the rug, like uh, they actually discovered me, and then we uh, did some collaboration, and I. I had to do some photo shoots also. So, <laughs> so uh, I relocated back to Nepal in 2018. I was living here in the Bay Area for over 20 years. And uh, finally, in 2018, uh, we relocated back after knowing that uh, uh, the visibility of the Nepali art scene or the Himalayan art scene is so limiting that uh, 
we decided maybe we need to do something about this. So I started a small nonprofit organization called Himalayan Art Initiative. Uh, uh, so we have like uh, several, we have employed several uh, traditional Thaka artists and uh, we have English class classes now for some of these like Himalayan artists. We have uh, computer skill classes and uh, some contemporary art classes too. And the idea is probably uh, uh, giving them uh, the skills, uh, the educations that they need so that we can prepare them to, based on my experiences, like uh, I felt uh, this is very valuable for the students in Nepal. And uh, to showcase their works, we also created a gallery, art gallery, like uh, uh, because uh, we have very limited galleries in uh, Nepal for these artists. Uh, we also have like about three uh, formal art schools. Uh, but uh, every year, I think uh, there are at least uh, at least uh, forty to fifty students from each art school graduating and there's a limited number of uh, galleries to showcase their works and projects so uh, for that we we recently opened another gallery uh, in a different location uh, so the idea is basically uh, I'm, I'm enjoying much more ju not just the studio practice but also working with the community working with the young artists and uh, uh, experimenting new things uh, trying to create visibility for ourselves uh, in some ways uh, in the west uh, as well as on international platforms so i'm just going to go through some of the installations from my recent exhibition uh, this was in uh, vmfa virginia museum of fine arts uh, was last year and this was Art Basel Hong Kong and uh, for the first time last year we were able to actually have a, a, a visibility at the Venice Biennale and uh, we had our first Nepal pavilion uh, and uh, uh, for that uh, I actually created some works again in collaboration with these uh, traditional artists. So for the painting, I collaborated with about like five other traditionally trained artists and all of them were credited. We created a, a, a rug installation, which was uh, in collaboration with rug makers. And uh, finally a bronze, uh, which was in collaboration with a few other artists from uh, so uh, this is the, uh, the the installation view that's it thank you Thank you, Rosalind, and thank you, BMFA for BMPFA for having me today, and Sherry Goodman as well from the Education Department. I'm thrilled to be here. When I met Sering Sherpa at the San Francisco Asian Art Museum 19 years ago, I was a young filmmaker and Buddhist art enthusiast. I would often troll the galleries, marveling at the complex symbologies of Buddhist paintings and sculptures, feeling that the key to life's deepest meanings was somehow hidden therein. It was during one such visit that I encountered a young artist demonstrating Tibetan Tanka painting. I was enthralled by his incandescent imagery and humble manner and asked him if he'd be interested in making a short film about Tanka painting. Being the gracious and modest person he was, he naively agreed. 
In retrospect, I think he was just too kind to say no. He insisted he wasn't all that good and recommended that I film his father, Ergendorje Sherpa, a master Tonka painter known throughout Nepal. That began a project which spanned the next 19 years in which I filmed Sering in the United States and his father, Ergendorje Sherpa, in Nepal, gaining rare insight into the, this ancient art form. It was an honor to have an intimate look into the lives of these two artistic masters and teachers. And I knew in my heart that others would also want to enter the sanctum of Buddhist art through this film. But what started as a film about Tibetan Tonka painting and a devout Buddhist artist soon morphed into the story of Tsering's struggle to find a place for his art in America and finding his own voice outside the role of religious painter the transition from Buddhist art to contemporary painting formed the backbone of the first third of the film. The film could have ended there, but his art kept moving beyond. His modern art caught on. The use of traditional imagery in a modern context, no longer for meditation, but for communication, found resonance with audiences worldwide, as well as with the commercial art world. His path became clear in purpose and brightened by success. His work took off in new directions, taking on a variety of forms, subjects, and mediums. I filmed every few years through the changes, deciding that this story was not quite finished. It was backburnered several times in between, then resumed with renewed vigor at each turn of Tsering's career. In 2017, I returned to Kathmandu to film Tsering's return to Nepal and the Kathmandu Triennale Art Show. This was to be the end of the film, but it turned out to be yet another beginning of a new and prodigious state of his art. He reconnected with family, community, and Nepali roots, and soon realized that art goes well beyond the canvas. In February 2021, I got a call from Tsering excited about a mid-career retrospective solo show that was being organized by the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. He asked if I could have the film ready for this show. I thought to myself, alas, my venue has come. A year later, I'd finished the rough cut of the film, then added a scene from Spirits, his solo show, for a really big ending. Once added, the film seemed complete. It had reached its apex, it was not just a story about an artist, a father-son story, an immigrant story, or even a rags-to-riches story, though it is a little of all of those. It's a story about triumph, about taking one's past, along with its losses and traumas, and transforming it into something strong and beautiful. Thus, wisdom and success are the last notes of the narrative arc of this film. When I started this film, I thought people would want to enter the inner sanctum of Buddhism through Tibetan Tonka painting. But in fact, there's another entrance. Though he no longer paints meditation images or even paints on canvas, Tsering's work embodies the idea of constant change. Nothing is static, nor should be. Tsering's work still brings a thoughtful Buddhist perspective and methodology into the works, but he accompanies it with an emphasis on what's alive what's growing and changing, and what should change when it has to. I once asked him how his departure from tradition has affected his karma, and he said, look around. I think it's worked out pretty well. <laughs> and I hope this film extends this message through the story. Today, I am delighted to premiere my film at <laughs> BAM PFA. <laughs> in the East Bay where this story took place to an audience of Tsering appreciators. I even recognize some of you from the early years and some of you even appear in the film from the Boundless uh, exhibition from at BAM PFA in 2019. Thank you BAM PFA friends and supporters of the film for coming to share this moment. I hope the film does justice to his illustrious career and conveys the excitement of his work and of our journey together. 
And with 19 years behind us, let there be no further ado. Let the show begin. Thank you, thank you, Saren and Sherry, for both uh, giving the talk and sharing your film. I'd like to invite both of you up here for some Q&A. We have about 10 minutes if anybody has some questions. There are attendants uh, throughout the theater who can pass you the microphone. I have one question. Uh, what's your, for both of you, what oh. is your next project? <laughs> Thank you, Rosalie. Uh, well, actually, uh, I'm working on a few other exhibitions uh, at the moment. Uh, One's going to be at uh, Asia Society in Houston, uh, Monterey Museum of Art. Uh, they're both in September. And uh, I have another exhibition coming up in Paris in 2024. So that's what I'm working on. Um, oh, I have a, are you, is it okay to ask a question now? Here. Um, so this is a question for both of you. Um, it seems like the both of you have traveled around quite a bit. What are your two favorite places that you've traveled to or like being in? Both of you. Uh, Bay Area. Kathmandu <laughs> <laughs> uh, and London for some reason. <laughs> Should I ask? Oh, oh. Uh, I love Paris and there's probably a place up there that I've never been to yet that will be my next favorite place. <laughs> my next project is actually some re related. I'll be completing um, the film about Sering, uh, Sering's dad, Ergen Dorje Sherpa, which was initially part of this film and then they became two separate films. So the next film, Images of Enlightenment, should be completed by the end of this summer and that deals with uh, traditional art, traditional tanka painting in Nepal, and the contributions of Ergen Dorje Sherpa and, and perhaps other traditional painters to that, that art today. Hi, this is a question for Sarin Sherpa over here. <laughs> Your work was so powerful and beautiful. It just drew me in. But I thought it was interesting. The um, you seem to, in your work, where you recognize how we as a society um, have turned uh, economy into God, and, um, and that's what's numinous for us. And so it seemed like that there was some um, uh, kind of social critique in that. But then later, you went to actually do work for uh, Gucci and Comme de Garcia. How do you reconcile that, or how did you move towards that? Uh, well... I get paid very little for that. <laughs> uh, the idea, I think uh, what I uh, came to find out was, uh, I was mentioning earlier that uh, for us uh, as artists from that particular region, Nepal, uh, I think Nepal is known more for mountaineering, uh, you know, like for many other things, but uh, I felt Nepal has a lot to offer as a destination for art. And also there are a number of really, really talented upcoming artists uh, working there constantly. And how do we provide that visibility? Uh, sometimes like uh, through these collaborations, they, I mean, even the company itself and their, their clients, they get attracted and they want to know more about that region and the artistic practices. So it was probably because of that I was very interested, even though I got paid very little for these projects. But that was more interesting part for me. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for this amazing project. Uh, I'm Tika Lamsal and I'm from Nepal as well. And it's so great to know both of you being a fellow Nepali and also my colleague Sally, we happen to teach at the same university. It's kind of fantastic. We came to know just this morning about this. Uh, congratulations to both of you for this uh, successful and so beautiful project. And to piggyback on the former question sharing, I may be just uh, asking you to relate your experience of you know connecting both spirituality and also the materialistic um, you know artifacts as you mentioned earlier uh, it is not that easy right when you are creating some kind of spiritual images by also bringing in some materialistic artifacts it is considered somehow sacrilegious especially in the context of traditional religious uh, kind of um, experiences in Nepal specifically and that would not be an easy task for you to undergo this sort of transformative experience in creating that sort of artifact that would embody both of these uh, aspects and it might have been pretty much challenging for you how did you reconcile that in your creative art that is so powerful to all of us as we watched it here thank you uh, I think uh, what I I think over years, what I've come to learn is that uh, I am probably projecting uh, who we are as individuals. Like I was thinking along the line and this uh, blurring the gap between sacred and secular, uh, tradition and contemporary, uh, I think East and West has been my practice. Uh, and also uh, we I, as a, let's say, a person born in Nepal, uh, uh, I felt, feel like uh, we are infused with so much of traditional, uh, uh, traditional ideas. Uh, but at the same time, we are also functioning as a contemporary being. Uh, I think of myself sometimes like when I'm, when I'm driving, uh, I remember like just a black cat maybe crossing the road ahead of you will like immediately stop you because you've been trained and you have been informed that this is like, okay, something bad is going to happen. So that kind of superstition is there. But at the same time, uh, in the evening, I might be seen in like very flashy nightclub, like having fun, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and uh, even when I was being trained as a traditional tanka painter, I was constantly listening to, uh, in my Walkman, like ACDC and, <laughs> and uh, Deep Purple or something. So that kind of thing is like so much in us. We're, we're like a combination of that. And probably that gets reflects in my work uh, much so often. Hi, um, uh, this seems really superficial now. I, I love your art and um, I'm wondering if there are gonna be any more garment textile uh, <laughs> things because I would really love to wear a visual representation so I can share your, um, your beautiful work with more people. I wasn't able to get to Virginia. I kept trying to figure out a way to make it possible. I saw all the merch and it was rad. So thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know what to say. Yeah, I'll definitely keep that in mind. <laughs> thank you. I, I dare say, I think it's still available. I've been getting emails from the VMFA store with advertisements saying the clothing, there's still some clothing available. So check out their, the VMFA store. I have a question for both of you. Um, I'm Rupi Tut. I'm a painter whose practice is built on tradition as well. And I think something that really annoys me about the contemporary art world is that I often have to explain that tradition is innovative. And I think something, Sherry, you said in your opening remarks for the film was that there is a change that occurs even within tradition or the way someone practices tradition. I think for both of you, I'm 
I'm hoping that there's something you can say where at least for those of us sitting here, we can kind of just believe finally that tradition is innovative. And I would just ask the question if you believe that, and I think your practice shows that you do. But yeah, what would you like to say about that? I was just curious, you as someone who's filmed it, being innovative, and then you as someone who practices it, being innovative. Thank you. Uh, yes, definitely. Tradition is in constant change. Uh, I, I had to explain that to many people when I was uh, still practicing uh, the iconography, traditional iconography, even in like traditional tanka paintings. If you look at the works from 10th century onwards until like present today, every century there's a change and there's so much input from the artist. And uh, this actually, because uh, we live in a, a world, sometimes like the viewer has such a lit little like attention span so that they don't really look through it carefully. But uh, it's, it's always changing. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 that's what I feel like. Uh, I actually have a question for Sherry. Um, Sherry, when you first embark on this journey of making this documentary, did you know it's going to take 19 years or <laughs> and and how do you plan of making such a documentary? I know you're working on the second one now, but can you just share with us a little bit, you know, the process of making such an amazing film? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for appreciating that aspect of it. And I just want to say as an aside, the second film will be ready in about 19 more years. So, <laughs> or by the end of the summer, whichever I get my mind to it. Um, you know, actually, I did not in any way know that this would last this long. Um, and at different points along the way, I guess life itself just sort of didn't allow me to release it as a, as a finished piece. And it was just a living process, if you will. Tsering's art just kept changing in such a big way. And I started to see that there was a, a, a little bit different story here than the one I originated with, um, which was really um, an homage to traditional art was supposed to be an acknowledgement of Tibet, Tibetan, not, not just Tibetan, but Himalayan uh, arts and how they were changing in this kind of new environment. Um, so... I guess the world just kind of came in and created a new idea for, for Sering and for me. And um, the film then, there were also just like life complications and different issues that prevented me from devoting myself entirely to, to this film. Um, the film actually was a passion project. It's started as a passion project and has continued throughout, um, mostly self-funded. And um, I would not recommend this as a commercial practice for any of you independent filmmakers out there. It's not commercially necessarily was never the, the goal here. Um, but I do believe that through these contemporary works and, and films and utilizing like media that's now available, it does bring attention not only to contemporary issues, but also to traditional arts and those things that actually do remain unchanging and, and valuable because, because so. Um, you know, some of the traditional arts really, it's just like any culture, there's kind of a bedrock of your identity and um, you always feel at home with it, no matter how far you stray. So I think what Sering's doing with using his platform to essentially bring attention to Himalayan art, traditional, modern, and incorporate it um, is, is extremely valuable for both traditional and for modern art. And, and in fact, just reinforces my love of traditional art because sometimes I see the bubblegum guy and I'm like, what happened here? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I love it, but I also, you know, have extreme devotional almost admiration for some of the traditional works as well. I have a question about the symbolism in the paintings. Is there particular symbolism associated with the different colors? Uh, in the traditional artwork, yes, there's a, like a lot of symbolism involved. But in my contemporary works, uh, not not really, because uh, I think I would like I would appreciate viewer to look at it as a whole than like. Uh, 
dissecting it into like little symbolisms. Yeeks. Oh, uh, I just want to say the best thing was the, how you both blend contemporary and tradition in the film and in your media trend. Um, my question, which I've always wanted to ask, is how did you come out to your father as a contemporary artist? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, it took me uh, seven years to convince him to actually see my work. And it was uh, in 2017, I had the opportunity to actually share it in person. And uh, just recently in Kathmandu, uh, we opened a new gallery. And uh, the first exhibition was uh, both my father and my work. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. And um, if they have some time, maybe you can catch them and ask some more questions if you'd like. Great, thank you.